Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Dr. Mary Jones is the founder and clinic director at Natural Harmony Reproductive Health. She's dedicated to empowering individuals to thrive naturally. As someone who lives with endometriosis, she understands the frustrations of feeling stuck with limited options. No matter your reproductive health challenges, you're not alone and you deserve the support to thrive. Mare believes in the power of both holistic Eastern medicine and traditional Western medicine. Merit strives to provide her clients with the best options tailored to their needs, guiding them through the complexities of reproductive health, especially in the face of endometriosis, and equip them with practical tools for daily improvement. Today, we are here with Dr. Merritt Jones, Doctor of Acupuncture and Integrative Medicine, and we are going to hear all about her story, and it is a good one, and fertility journey, and talk about integrative health, and some of the some of the issues that come up around and in the endo community around what this actually means, what it actually looks like, and how acupuncture can really be helpful for fertility in the context of endometriosis, along with reduction of Im- symptoms, pain, and improving quality of life. Hi, Merit. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on, and it's great to see you, and I'm lucky to have you locally to me, and you were actually one of the first people that I met when I moved to San Diego um, in the endo community, both who is... De- has dealt with endo, but also who treats those with endo. So, um, yeah, great to have you. Thank you. That's right. I know it's been a while. I was trying to think about when we first connected, and it's a lot's happened in that time. <laughs> yes, I feel lucky to have been able to kind of see that, and you know, great to have you as an ally in the community and helping and you know, texting, what do you think about this? That that was, that has been really helpful for me. And oh my gosh, absolutely mutual. And you are such a rock star. I'm like, just so so blown away with um, all of the different endo pots that you have your hands in, (laughs) in the best way. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. Sometimes I overdo it. It's it's like I have FOMO, like I want to do this and I want to do this. And, um, it's all great and it's fun and it's great to have built a community now, um, to do this with. So yeah, team endo. Well, (laughs) yes, team endo. Um, I know that you have, you know, shared your story more recently publicly through your social media channels and you've been on podcasts talking about everything. For those of us who haven't heard you before, we would like to hear your story and journey through that diagnosis and what it's been like both having endo and running a practice uh, through COVID, the ups and downs, and struggling with trying to find the right treatments. Yeah, definitely. Um, gosh, where do I start? So I will I will share the nitty gritty of my story. Um, with the caveat, you know, since I since I first kind of opened up about my hysterectomy that happened last year and just the details of, you know, the time span between when I was 15 and now I'm 38, um, I've had some kind of panicked messages from folks on social media saying, oh, my gosh, my symptoms kind of resonate. Am I going to have to have a hysterectomy? Like, you know, just freaking out a little bit, and understandably, because endo can be very scary. but what I want to say is I, I share my story with the hope that it empowers folks to be their own advocates rather than panic about what might be going on. My story is extreme. Odds are good that your story is not going to end up like mine. Um, so an early intervention is key, which is kind of the point of all of this, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, okay, my story. Um, I come by endometriosis very naturally. Unfortunately, I have it um, very strong on both sides of my family, my mom and my grandmother on my mom's side. There's a couple of women on my dad's side as well. My grandmother actually had a lesion on her neck uh, you know, uh, that would literally bleed every month when she was on her period. 
<laughs> wow. Never had a formal diagnosis, but with that information, I'm like, plus all the just wild reproductive history she had, I'm like, yeah, you have endo also. Um, so, you know, from the onset of menstruation, my cycles were just bad. Within two or three cycles, I was having um, really bad pain and eventually nausea and a lot of digestive issues. And I remember from you know, the time I remember, I think it was in early high school, the first time that I was sent home from school with bad periods, quote unquote, and I was throwing up in the car. And I remember my mom just looking horrified, not really knowing what to do. She called my doctor, who was a pediatrician, who said, you know, it's bad period pain, welcome to womanhood, take some ibuprofen. And that essentially was the story that I heard over and over again for about 15 years. Um, and, you know, I know now that I had endometriosis, but there was 15 years of passing out in airport bathrooms and before job interviews and, you know, just important and not so important life and life events that were just completely obliterated by my undiagnosed endometriosis. Um, and it took, my, gosh, I've had five surgeries. Um, the first one obviously didn't happen until I got my formal diagnosis, which was at age 26 and only after lots of medical gaslighting and me finally insisting, um, that somebody do something, you know, I literally told my gynecologist at the time, um, that I wasn't leaving her office until I got some imaging <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of like, it, I, I say now all the time to my patients, you have to be your own advocate because the education around endo is just not there. Um, and she did ultrasound. They found a 10 centimeter endometrioma. Well, what we found out was an endometrioma. Um, you know, so I went in for surgery within a week or two after that and came out on the other side with a formal diagnosis of stage four endometriosis um, and the conversation that my fertility was not looking good. Um, and I went, you know, I had uh, two, I had another surgery after that Without knowing at the time what I should be looking for, I had two two surgeries from folks who did not do excision, uh, and that definitely, I think, made things even worse and an already bad situation worse. Um, and then I had two excision surgeries that helped a ton, um, but during COVID, um, my stress levels went through the roof, <laughs> as I'm sure you can relate to. You know, running a running a practice and having a family um while just navigating the craziness of covid just shot my nervous system my image was totally fried and my endo exploded again the symptoms exploded again and i was done i knew at that point that i couldn't have kids thankfully you know my we have a backup uterus in my <laughs> in my family my wife doesn't love when i refer to her that way but she was able to bring our children into the world um and i was just done so i told you know our amazing decision surgeon here in san diego that i was done and i wanted to direct me um and she did it and it's been freaking amazing <laughs> it's been wonderful um yeah and and she was actually the one who told me I, it took my fifth surgery for somebody to say oh you also have adenomyosis i, I wow. knew that like some part of me knew that but it was so frustrating that it took me until I was, what, 37 years old to have that <laughs> information given to me. Um, yeah. 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 It would be nice to know that up front. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that. And I have lots of things I want to come back to. You Please. said a few things that I think are really great to expand upon. First, that's a very interesting family history. And mm -hmm. I know, I feel like from you, I've seen or heard of some of the more rare things. I remember getting a text from you one time and like, what do we think this is? And there was like some belly button stuff. But <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. I don't remember if we ever talked about what came from that. But, you know, even just hearing about that, that uh, I think a lesion or, or a skin mm -hmm. tag or something that was bleeding cyclically, we hear about endo can be everywhere. But I haven't seen that in many people. Um, yeah. So you always have the most interesting facts. Mm -hmm. But my, <laughs> my doctor always says when I when she refers me to folks now, tell them you're a zebra. <laughs> tell them you're a zebra. Yes. Like, you know, they should think not hoof prints, not horse prints, not horse. What's the saying? Think horses, not zebras. Horse, think of uh, zebras. Yeah. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, and yeah, so I think that's good stuff. for. <laughs> 
Yes. I think it's good for people to know, like what you said earlier, your story is more extreme. And just for people that don't really understand what zebras are, these are the, you, you hear this, you think this, but it's totally something else. Most people aren't zebras, um, luckily, and the zebras are hard to treat and identify. And it takes, it's more complex in getting to the the final answer. So yes, I think you're correct. And at least in what I've seen too, it's usually not the case. Um, but with your strong family history, was that sort of something looking back after you understood more of what was going on that you started to put together the pieces? Because I'm sure they have not been told, oh, I have endo, right? They just have these symptoms. And then when you start having symptoms, there's this normalization that occurs and no one else has a reference point. That is just how it is. Yep. Correct? Absolutely. Yes. And you know, it's, I think I probably annoyed the female family members, <laughs> my female family members for a while after I got my diagnosis. And, and as I started to de- take the deep dive into studying it, I'm sure that they got more information than they wanted from me. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely normalized. I mean, my, you know, God bless my grandmother. She, she had horrific gynecological care throughout her history. My mom mm-hmm. never received a formal diagnosis either. Um, but it's very clear to me that that's what was going on. And yeah. now we have these younger women coming up in my family and I can see it and I can see it so clearly. And even still with our history and with all of the, you know, work that I'm trying to do and that I see so many other wonderful humans trying to do, sometimes they don't hear it or they don't want to hear it. And there is still just such a normalization around women's uh, more than just pain we know endo is more than just pain but pain is a huge part of it right um yeah yeah it's very frustrating <laughs> yes and for those people that don't really understand the term gaslighting because this mm-hmm. is a common term in the endo community and i think many patients have maybe heard this or maybe not and but i've probably experienced this can you explain that a little bit i i think yeah can you explain yeah. what that looks like? And um, gosh, so for me in this in my story, you know, in my endo story, it looked like me going into literally probably fifteen different doctors' offices, saying I have horrific pain. This is not normal. Do something, and them saying no, no, it is normal. It's just part of being a woman. Suck it up, you know. Basically telling me that my experience wasn't real or valid. Um, and it's a huge problem, I think, in women's health in general, not to get on my soapbox about it, but especially for endo. Um, it's a huge problem. Yeah. I don't know. I don't see many endo patients in my practice who haven't experienced that, which is so infuriating, really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Hopefully, for those that are listening that didn't realize there is a term for that, but have ex- that experience now, there is a name for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your fertility journey and how that looked for you, maybe in comparison to somebody in a very heterosexual, normative mm-hmm. relationship. I'm doing air quotes if anyone's listening. Um, <laughs> just, just approaching doctors and having that discussion and were there assumptions being made? Did your, do you feel like your care changed or the decisions or your options were different? Do you mean, were my options different because I had endo or because I was in an M in a same sex relationship? Both actually. Um, gosh, well, for the endo component of it, I think I went into it and my doctors also went into it knowing that the odds were very slim. You know, by the time that we had started trying, I was just past my past my third surgery. Um, and I knew that things were not looking good in there. My tubes were technically, one of them was open, but um, there was just so much scarring and so much inflammation that, you know, I kind of knew what I was walking into. Um, mm-hmm. We tried for a year doing IUIs and we had no luck. Um, my team, for the most part, you know, by that point, I, I was very fortunate to have assembled a team that did hear me and were really, really great about working with me. Um, and after a year, I was just 
heartbroken. It's so devastating. It's such a roller coaster to have to gear up every month, even if without endometriosis, like the infertility just sucks. There's no way around it. And then adding the very messy layer of endo to the picture um, and having to navigate the pain during ovulation and, some, you know, during um, the luteal phase, just all of it um, yeah. made it a really challenging journey. And so after a year, we decided to pass the baton off to my wife. And thankfully, she did not have a lot of issues. Um, so in that regard, that was, you know, a pretty, I think for most people, the vast majority of people I see in my clinic are, you know, are same sex, I mean, sorry, uh, not same sex couples, <laughs> heterosexual couples, um, trying to get pregnant. And so the story is different. There isn't usually that other option to just shift the womb. Um, and yeah, of course, we see that a lot too. Um, yes. And that is, you know, navigating that is exceptionally challenging if there's a lot of stuff you can take to kind of um, assess, you know, what the hurdles might be with endo. Obviously, one of the biggest is just the inflammation that comes with it. But knowing whether or not you also have adenomyosis, knowing whether or not your tubes are open, um, you know, just all the all the minutia of it, I think, are even more important and more amplified when you have endo. Yeah. Um, now, did you, did you ever undergo the hormones to extract eggs? And if so, okay. Um, I, I actually didn't know that. And so I wasn't sure if that yeah. was the situation and I know that adds, but I'm sure you see patients that do undergo that. Absolutely. Um, can you speak a little bit to that and what it might look like for somebody with endo and maybe somebody without endo, if, if you, Oof, yeah, if you have that understanding. Such a fantastic question. Yeah. I, I consciously chose not to put my body through IVF because we had the option of another woman. I wasn't particularly attached to, you know, biological children or to carrying a child. Um, my babies are amazing. I'm very grateful for them. Um, yeah. The process of stimulating the ovaries, for egg retrieval requires a lot of estrogen for most folks. Um, and it, we know that estrogen is potentially problematic for endo, even in normal amounts. So bombarding the body with that excessive estrogen, um, although in some cases absolutely necessary, if that's your only route to having a baby, you know, it's a very reasonable choice to make, but it is, I think, often... Um, not totally understood, like what your what the endo patient is walking into with IVF. You know, there are a couple of um, not enough, but there are a few studies out there about endo and IVF and how it might not be the safest option for those with endo because on the other side, a lot of times we have embryos and maybe we can make a baby, which of course is the end goal, um, but at, at what cost and what a terrible decision to have to make, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a really great point that you highlighted. And I I see a lot of patients, I don't obviously do um, things related to fertility in my practice, but because I see so many people with endo, um, I've seen a lot of, of patients that didn't know that they had endo. Sometimes the first conversation is with me. Sometimes they finally found that diagnosis, but they've done IVF prior without knowing. And I don't think that they were really told, and maybe that's because the practitioner didn't understand endo too, that their body was going to go through that and how terrible they felt. Right. And it is an option. And I, I can imagine if that is your ultimate goal, when you're told, here's, here's what to expect. And I am sure many people would choose that. And that is the right choice for them because that is patient centered care. Right. right. Um, but explaining that and in setting up expectations versus, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for is probably a really tough thing um, to navigate. Yeah. Informed consent, right? Across all areas of, well, health, but especially reproductive health. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So if somebody comes to you, um, do, do you get people before they're choosing to do IVF if that's something that they need to do and what other options are out there? We get the whole spectrum of, of fertility and reproductive health stuff in our clinic. Um, a lot of times we have folks who are already 
on the IVF path and have, you know, maybe done a couple of retrievals without success. Um, it's, it's common to see folks with endo sometimes have a harder time, especially if they have endometriomas or something that really, you know, can contribute to just degrading the quality of eggs. Um, so we do get folks who are, who've already been through it and are just looking for support in the middle of it. Um, we definitely also get folks, uh, who are, maybe not even sure that IVF might need to be on their radar, you know, and who are just, maybe you don't even know they have endo are coming in with bad periods and have been trying to conceive for two or three years. And those are often the patients um, that we can have a huge impact on. Not that we can't with the folks who are already in IVF, we certainly can, but being able to kind of catch folks and help educate them on what might be going on um, and the ways that we can intervene with, um, you know, all the different tools we have to help reduce inflammation and, and or immune function. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a challenging, I think it's, there, there's no easy way to move through fertility with endo unless you're one of the lucky ones who's just not affected, you know, about half of us yeah. with endo are. Um, yeah. I don't know. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. So what would, what are your kind of go-tos from the more integrative health aspect and acupuncture aspect in addressing fertility? Let's say, for example, um, somebody may consider IVF, but they want to try to maximize their potential with more natural treatments. And maybe they do know that they have endo or don't know that they have sure. endo. What would that look like for them? And what are some of your kind of go-to strategies in helping improve? Yeah, absolutely. So through my lens, um, I think our primary focus often is just addressing all of the insane inflammation that comes with endo, right? We know that it can affect egg quality. It can affect progesterone receptors. It can affect implantation. Like there's just so much. Um, that comes with the inflammation that we see with endo that can really be a problem for fertility. And so we implement the tools that we have in our toolbox to help just kind of mitigate some of that. Um, nutrition is my go-to, which I know you also love. It's my first, it's the first thing I reached for. Obviously I'm an acupuncturist. I love acupuncture. I will talk about all the ways in which acupuncture can help, but um, looking for nutritional deficiencies certainly I think is a big one because we know that folks with endo burn through their antioxidant reserves a lot quicker than somebody without endo. And so identifying any nutrient deficiencies, fortifying with all of the nutrient dense foods, maybe supplementing. I like to do um, micronutrient, sorry, micronutrient testing just to get a really clear picture on where somebody might need a little extra support. Um, also, Looking at gut health, which is one that I, I'm sure you run into a lot too, we just kind of have to explain to folks like, yes, you came to me to promote uh, better egg quality and let's talk about your poop, you know, um, yeah. but gut health plays a huge role in inflammation and uh, even, just, you know, the final stages of hormone metabolism. And so mm -hmm. that's actually often where, where I go first is really doing a deep dive with digestive uh, history, mending and addressing anything that needs to be done there, and then doing the micronutrient panel because if, if the gut's not in good shape, eating all of the things isn't going to help, right? <laughs> if you can't absorb it. Exactly. It. Yeah. Um, and then acupuncture is, of course, one of my favorite tools um, for fertility and for endometriosis. It, it works beautifully to help reduce inflammation, to help promote blood flow to wherever we're directing blood flow. In this case, obviously, it would be to the womb and to the ovaries. Um, can help with scar tissue as well. So we definitely work with folks with stop for acupuncture. But that's another another story. Um, what else? Light, lifestyle, stress, right? Of course, we know how stress yeah. impacts the nervous system and can really upregulate pain for those with endo. It's also a bummer for fertility <laughs> um, for that yes. same reason. And acupuncture also helps to put the nervous system into a more parasympathetic place, which can be helpful both for endo pain and for just sending the message to the brain that it is safe to make a baby. It's okay to yeah. get pregnant right now, right? 
I do remember going, we did a session with me and I had had one session previously from somebody else, great acupuncturist, but I have a severe fear of needles. <laughs> it's actually I'd quite irrational. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> it's actually quite irrational, but you, you had explained, you know, this is slightly different. Um, and I felt lovely. I felt like I was just floating on a cloud okay. leaving that. And yeah, it was, it was very relaxing. I was not scared. Um, however, your technique may have been different. And I, maybe I'm just remembering that that differently or there is somewhat of a different training that you had um i yeah yeah there's a there's a kind of a wide spectrum of acupuncture styles and the school that i went to up in berkeley um had a specialty in japanese uh acupuncture styles which is just a little bit of a gentler hand, a different approach, um, philosophically a little bit. So it was a hybrid school. So I got the traditional Chinese medicine foundation. Um, and I also got the additional training in other techniques, essentially for the needle phobes, <laughs> right? I yeah. use it on my kids. Um, and I use it, you're certainly not alone in, um, not wanting to be poked with needles and understandably and most folks when they think of needles think of the big hypodermic needles but acupuncture needles are you know a fraction of that size um but there's also different techniques uh and i, I tend to have a gentler hand uh, because i also don't like being heavily stimulated with yeah. acupuncture needles <laughs> yeah yeah it was a very different experience than my previous one where i felt like i was so tense after and yeah. just more revved up but yeah I remember that whole rest of that day it was very it was very memorable and just felt so calm and and lovely so oh, that's nice um, to hear a like, testament to a to the nervous system piece of it right yeah absolutely yeah. thank you yes well I want to I want to talk with you a little bit about the dietary approaches because you mentioned that and I completely agree about gut health and what is great is we are starting to have some more research right on the impact of the gut microbiome in particular mm -hmm. and inflammation and how that is related to endo. There's some thoughts that it's a driver and it stimulates endo. Um, it can progress it. It can impact symptoms. Mm -hmm. And now I think some of the first microbiome studies that I saw were a few years back and I, more and more people are starting to do them now mm -hmm. to really better understand that because we do know that there are certain more inflammatory bacteria that have been found in both uh, the genital urinary tract and the gut in elevated amounts in mm -hmm. those with endometriosis. And I think microbiome is just generally a newer area of research that we have a long way to go. But I want to talk about those strategies, but also in relation to what we see promoted in the endo community and how we approach this and look at it, because I think there's a lot of misleading information, although it can be good information, it's just sometimes taken out of context. And what do you, what do you, what's your thought as far as dietary approaches? Uh, we hear a lot of gluten-free, dairy-free is best. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that to mm -hmm. start with? Dietary approaches for endo. Um, I mean, I think Diet and nutrition in general have a huge impact on health, whether or not you have endo. And for those who have endo, um, identifying any triggers that are going to promote inflammation in the body need to be dealt with. Um, you know, there's a lot of info out there that I think it's kind of misconstrued about nutrition treating or curing endo. And that's certainly not what we are peddling, right? There's doesn't have to be either or it can be it can be both all of the integrative therapies and the more um, you know, surgical interventions and all that but as far as um, kind of approaching how, you know how we would tackle nutrition specifically for endo taking out all of any inflammatory triggers is can be a first step um, but I sometimes see folks go overboard with that right gluten can be inflammatory dairy can be inflammatory um, Dairy can also be a superfood to the to the right person, right? Gluten, I, I'm kind of on the fence about, but I don't know that it triggers everybody. Um, yeah, I think where a lot of, I think where there's a lot of missed opportunity for nutrition is 
focusing on what we can add in uh, yes. to fortify, right? Because like we've already kind of talked about, the endo body is very probably uh, more needs more micronutrients than the average bear. Um, and so certainly remove any foods that you know trigger you because that's not helping your immune system and it's going to upregulate inflammation for sure. Uh, and that can look different for everybody. Gluten, dairy, you know, eggs, soy can be common triggers, but they're not always the trigger. Sometimes it's kale. If you have, especially if you have some other yeah. gut issues, right? Um, and yeah. you have some hyperpermeability and your immune system is already upregulated. I've seen people react to the most benign foods in the world, right? So it's not, mm -hmm. It's not just about removing, it's about being strategic about what you're removing. Um, and then also being really mindful about what you're putting in. And I always tell my patients, you know, try, if, if your stomach is strong enough, your digestive system is strong enough, try to eat a rainbow of naturally colorful foods every day as a, just a baseline. Um, and then, you know, good quality protein, good quality fat at every meal, trying to keep blood sugar stable. I think that's another piece that often gets overlooked with endo we hear about it a lot yes. for pcos but it, dysregulated blood sugar is inflammatory no matter who you are um and that applies to endo as well and can really um you know promote inflammation and also mess with hormones which is not helpful when we're dealing with a hormone sensitive condition one thing that really is kind of my pet peeve when it comes to dietary stuff especially in regards to endo is we are just shunted with gluten-free and dairy-free. And and I completely agree that there is very appropriate times that those are necessary. That being said, that does not mean that the alternatives are better, right? There's a right way to totally. do that. And there yeah. is a very much wrong way to do it. And we are bombarded with marketing and mm -hmm. we are bombarded with big food to to sell something and to purchase something that we think it's on this list. So it's better for me. Yeah. And the research does show there was a great systematic review on dietary interventions for endo and looking at what they're suggesting. I, I believe it was in this article that they highlight some of that, or it could have just been in some other articles I was looking at, but m many of the gluten-free and dairy-free products, even your, most people's almond milks mm -hmm. and oat milks mm -hmm. are actually ultra processed foods. And we don't think about that. Yeah. Full of vegetable oils. I know uh, oat milk. I feel like I break patients' heart on the a daily with oat milk. <laughs> you know? Like, you know that oat milk has vegetable oil in it, right? Which is a real a real problem for your inflammation. Uh, yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah, and and I want to also caveat that in that. Luckily, now people are catching on to that. So if you need to be, you know, dairy free, you can buy an almond milk that is not ultra processed and has almonds, water, sea salt. Yeah. So there are options within that, too. So I don't want to kill anyone's like, totally I can't, yeah. can't eat my almond milk. And now I can't <laughs> eat dairy milk. So there are options out there. But but you really have to think about things uh, really in, more in depth than what we're just being told. Well, and going, you know, if somebody decides to go gluten free and then buys bunch of gluten-free bread and crackers and cookies and you know all of that certainly is going to be just as inflammatory <laughs> as right the other stuff. and yeah. but we don't but many people like don't think about that just because right. it, but it's on this list right and so just yeah. because it's on a list doesn't make it a good food or a bad food which I don't really love those terms anyways um, totally. as long as we're talking about real food yeah but yeah it, it's just we have to better identify what things are what and and it's really hard with all of the marketing and social media and cultural influence um, that we have all around us. So mm -hmm. just because it says organic doesn't really oh, yeah. make it healthy. Yeah, the greenwashing is very real. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Now you have shared other, you've been on other podcasts, you've been interviewed, you've shared your story. Is there anything that has come up in being on on those platforms that you felt like you'd really want to hit on or dive deeper into or want to share on this podcast? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I feel like I could probably speak for a full 24 hours about gut health and, you know, the role of the microbiome. I think you already touched on that a little bit though. Um, I don't know if you want to go here Happy or not. to expand more. Do you? You want to talk about gut health a little bit more? Yeah. Okay. Let's yes. Go. Let's go there. Um, so 
I think when I look at gut health, especially we hear a lot about endo belly, right? Uh, in the endo community, this is like really extreme distension. Um, and a lot of times there's a digestive component to it. Of course, sometimes endo in and of itself is just so inflammatory that it can create endo belly. Yeah. But one of the more common reasons that I see it that gets misdiagnosed, or not just not even misdiagnosed, just missed, um, is SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And yeah. so I am just literally every day that I'm in clinic, finding, diagnosing, treating SIBO. Um, and so I think that probably is something that maybe, do you, do you see a lot of SIBO as well? All the yeah. time. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I see, I, I'm happy to see, um, more awareness. I think being brought to this, this piece of endo and endo belly SIBO is very common. Uh, I'm not sure that we're really getting to the root of why somebody's dealing with SIBO. It's, like, it's a very common yeah. thing to see, you know, um, somebody with SIBO be treated for antibiotics and sent on their treated with antibiotics and sent on their way without looking at why they developed it in the first place. What's going on with motility? Um, how are we going to keep it from coming back? You know, so um, all of that, which with endo, you know, especially if there's adhesions on the bowel um, that yeah. can slow transit time, can be kind of a, a complicated dance. Um, mm-hmm. So SIBO is a big one treating that um and then also looking at the large intestine the microbiome in the large intestine we do a lot of poop testing (laughs) in our clinic i think you do too um yeah and that's you know again the the microbiome in the gut and the microbiome in the pelvis there's some relationship there i don't think we have enough information to really be super definitive on what it is but there's something there's something to it right and so if Mm -hmm. there is an imbalance in the gut, if the might either an undergrowth or an overgrowth of something problematic, then certainly we need to address that as well. Usually that's with herbs and supplements, sometimes prescriptive antibiotics, depending on what's going on, uh, and then dietary interventions for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's SIBO. If, if anyone's listening and stop with SIBO, they know how frustrating. And mm-hmm. I think the question always is, is it going to come back? I heard right. it's lifelong. Um, do I have to keep battling it? And I think what you said about you have to find the root cause. Mm-hmm. And even Dr. Pimentel, who's really kind of the lead researcher at, at Cedars, who does a lot of the, the testing and research on SIBO, even in their papers, they, they basically state it's always a piece of something much bigger. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Like you mentioned, adhesions on the bowel, but we know that many people don't have adhesions on the bowel. So why is it so common, right? So Mm -hmm. I also think about just stress and the impact of our stomach acid and not having that barrier there. Absolutely, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, truly, I think that is one of the most commonly missed things is not supporting that at the time of whether they're choosing to do antibiotics or herbal therapies. I feel like that's so key in addressing and then uh, just overall inflammation. And we know that there's an established correlation and research has shown over and over again that when you have overgrowth or certain types of bacteria in the gut, They are present in the genitourinary Mm -hmm. tract too. We have studies in endo. We also have studies in the non-endo population showing that. Um, So yeah, I think it's it's a very frustrating uh, condition to treat. I think the prepping for taking the test is probably one of the most stressful (laughs) things. I definitely have uh, have received some complaints from patients prepping for it. (laughs) Absolutely. No fun. Yeah. Also doing the poop yeah. test is gross. Nobody likes to do it, but it's such wonderful <laughs> information on the other side. Yeah, I agree. I first going into like my first real endo surgery and I share a little bit about my story in the first episode for anyone listening that wants to know a little bit more that hops on on this one. Um, but I, my, my symptoms as an adult started when I was about 27, 28 after enormous stress. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't poop for three months. Literally, I didn't poop for three months. Oh my gosh. And uh, yeah. And the, 
the interesting thing was, is diet wise, I was probably the most healthiest I I have ever been in my entire life. And so that was really interesting. Um, There was obviously a clear stress component, but I was so bloated and uncomfortable. And I started like breaking out acne everywhere. I remember going to a dermatologist and there was nothing on my face, actually. It was really interesting. And I remember writing on my paperwork, you know, not on my face, like throughout my body. I wanted to understand and so dismissive. I was crying in the mm-hmm. office, um, clearly didn't read any of my paperwork. He literally walked in and said, you look fine. Oh, girl, that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Been there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It it took me about two and a half to three years of going and seeing, uh, I saw a few doctors, I had a colonoscopy, everything's normal. Strangely enough, the prep actually kind of reset at least the pooping, which was really nice, but the bloating and all of that didn't yeah. subside. And it wasn't until I moved back to California that I I went and saw a GI doctor that we worked with. And he, he said, has any has anyone talked to you about SIBO? No idea what that was. Um, yeah. I ended up having, I treated it three different times. I ended up having a combination of hydrogen and methane, I hydrogen sulfide, and I did treat it. I tried it both naturally and antibiotic wise. And I remember going into the, my first real excision surgery and I, I had just finished the Zyfaxin and um, yeah, I was, I was treating it up until I went into surgery and I haven't dealt with it since. So yeah, that was very interesting. Other gut stuff, yes, but SIBO, no, which is knock on wood. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, SIBO is a beast. Um, I love, though, that finally we are seeing some gastroenterologists um, accepting that it's a thing, <laughs> you know? And actually, yes. like, I would say at least 50% of the time, uh, if I have a patient who has a gastroenterologist and I suspect that they have SIBO, their GI will run the test for them and it's covered by insurance, which used to be such a battle. Um, and then, of course, yeah. the other half says, oh, that's not a real thing, which tells us that they're just not quite up to date on the latest info. Um, yes. Yeah. But yeah, the gaslighting, again, you, you, who hasn't experienced it? It's so frustrating. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I just remember being like, if you would have just read the first line on my paperwork, yeah. Um, and and looked, but you know, he just outed himself. Like clearly, he's not reading anything. And yeah. and to say that, I was so frustrated. Yeah. And and it's, I was living in Hawaii at the time, and it it's warm there. And his suggestion to me just about that, um, totally not SIBO related, but you know, he said, you know, well, we do live in Hawaii. It's it's really humid out. And for example, you may just if you go and exercise or go for a run, like you need to go home and take a shower right away. You may not be able to like go to the grocery store. And I was like, am I like this unhygienic teenager? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. Not to say that teenagers are unhygienic, but I was like, I felt like he was talking to me like I was like a 12 year old boy or something. I don't know. It was really disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Very frustrating. And I wish, you know, I wish I could say that I didn't hear stories like that all the time or experience stuff like that myself. Yeah. Yeah. A long way to go. Yes. Well, that's why we're doing this, right? So yeah. that other people hopefully can get this information early on and not experience or minimize the, the gaslighting and those awful experiences. So yeah, hopefully definitely. that does get out there. Um, you are working on some projects right now in all your, in all your spare time. <laughs> God help me. Yes, I am. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on? And um, yeah, so I just this morning actually signed the signed the Let's Do It paperwork. Um, so I'm working with somebody to help me put together some online courses um, centered around all things reproductive health. Of course, one of my biggest passions is endometriosis. So there will certainly be a lot of content on there for that. Um, the idea for me is, you know, I get, I, I am reached out to often by folks who are not local or not, you know, I'm licensed in California and it just it becomes more and more clear to me that accessibility to, mm-hmm. to folks who understand endometriosis is an issue. You know, the world is big and it takes time for information to get out there. Um, and so I'm hoping to make courses that are just educational and accessible 
and you know hopefully we'll make somebody's life easier <laughs> who's facing all of this yeah. um, so hopefully by the end of the year I will keep you posted Awesome. Yeah. Where can people go to kind of keep up with your progress uh, on the courses, learn more information about what you do, how yeah. acupuncture can help? Yeah. Um, so my my social media, uh, Dr. Merritt Jones on Instagram is where I you know post all of my passion projects and, and nerdy stuff. We also have our clinic um, social media, which is NHRH Integrative Fertility. We're here in San Diego. You can check us out online. It's just naturalharmonyhealth.com. Um, we love working with, you know, I love collaborating with you. I love working with the local San Diego folks. And we are trying to get stuff in place so that we can work with folks from a distance as well. So, yeah. If somebody listening is not in California, do you have a place that is your go-to to find resources where other other people can find these types of resources elsewhere? Well, I care better. It's certainly a wonderful place to start. I was so happy to see this launch. <laughs> um, yes. That's probably one of my favorites. Oh, gosh. Where else? Um, or specifically to like fertility or or acupuncture for fertility, those types of resources too? You know, there's actually, I wish there was a better um, resource network for fertility acupuncturists. ABORM might be a place to start. Um, A-B-O-R-M. There there are certainly um, folks on there who have gone out of their way to study uh, in detail the fertility stuff. Finding somebody who specializes in endo, there aren't there aren't too many, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, there's a couple up in Canada, but yeah, it's a tough it's tough to find folks who, at least in this field, I wish it was easier. That's part of what I'm trying to to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, and and I do know that right now, as far as I care better, it's it's surgeons and physical therapists. But the the goal is to expand to all all things endo and yeah. endo related to find practitioners. So hopefully that will be in the not so far future. Yeah, um, because I think that that is really important for to go to one site to be able to find. Um, people in your area so absolutely yeah yeah is there anything else you would like to share with anyone last thoughts um encouraging advice Mm -hmm. yeah I just want to say thank you like I said you're such a powerhouse for you know getting the info out there and for learning I mean your brain is amazing um (laughs) I think the biggest you know the biggest takeaway that I'm hoping you know folks leave with is just being your own advocate there's there's a long way to come we've made a lot of progress in the endo world and there's a long way to go still so if you suspect that you're dealing with endo or if you know you have endo and you're not being taken seriously um don't be afraid to get loud or find other care it takes a village yeah keep going yeah yeah well thank you so much for sharing your story and teaching us about gut health and nutrition and fertility and acupuncture Mm -hmm. Um, Go follow Merit, and hopefully you will share this episode with others that may be dealing with this, and they can learn something too. So hopefully everyone learned something, and we look forward to talking with you maybe in the future too um, after your project's launch. Absolutely. You know where to find me. (laughs) All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms, at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Endometriosis.